Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Stacey Matrazo. I am the executive director of the Florida Wildflower Foundation. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar, How to Start a Backyard Revolution. Um, if you haven't already, please uh, enter in the chat your location. We'd love to know where everyone is uh, joining us from today. For those of you not familiar with our organization, our mission is to protect, connect, and expand native wildflower habitat through education, research, planting, and conservation programs. Our work is made possible primarily by the sale and renewal of the state wildflower license plate. There's still a few of these of our old design on the road, but this is what uh, hopefully more of you are seeing now. If you have either a state license plate, the old or the new design, you are supporting us and we thank you. You are also eligible for a membership with our organization. Um, you just need to let us know that you have the plate and we'll get you set up. Funds from the sale and renewal of the state wildflower license plate, as well as donations and memberships allow us to do programs like what you'll see today um, and to support and create projects that build awareness and knowledge of native wildflowers and plants throughout Florida. We'd like to encourage those of you who find our programs valuable to consider becoming a member, making a donation, or purchasing that state wildfire license plate. Be sure to check out our website for resources on planting and growing wildflowers, to learn where to see wildflowers in bloom, um, to learn about our upcoming events, and much more. We are also on social media. You can find us on most platforms at FLA Wildflowers. Our next uh, webinar next month will be presented by Amanda Martin, founder of Grounded Solutions. Um, and the topic will be prune your native plants, how, when, and why it matters most. That's on November 15th. Uh, you can register for that on our website. We also have some great field trips coming up next month. We will be at Jonathan Dickinson State Park uh, we will uh, be joined by Explore Natural Martin to do a fall wildflower hike on the Kitchen Creek Nature Trail. And in December, we will have our annual Christmas tree cutting field trip at Ocala National Forest. So again, follow us on social media, subscribe to our newsletter, um, check out our website, and uh, stay abreast of all of the opportunities we have coming up. I have just a couple housekeeping items before we get started. All attendees are muted and cameras are turned off. If you have questions, please use the Q&A feature to submit them. The chat is open. Uh, and again, we are asking people to, um, to note in the chat where they're calling in from. But if you have questions for our presenter, please use the Q&A feature. We will address questions at the end of the talk as time permits. And if your question's not answered, you can always email it to us at info at flawildflowers.org and we will get an answer for you. This webinar is being recorded. It will be available on our YouTube channel and our website in about 24 to 48 hours. Once it is available, you will receive an email from us with a link to the recording along with a resource page from uh, with links from the webinar. And now I would like to introduce our speaker. Sarah Burke is a communications advisor to community leaders with a master's degree in digital media and over two decades of international experience. She's an expert in communicating complex information to the public in ways that result in measurable real world change. She serves as chair and director of communications for the Florida Wildflower Foundation. Burke first visited Florida in 2008 and fell in love with the state's unique ecology. She now uses her skills in lifestyle and technical publishing to help the public learn about Florida's biodiversity and what can be done to protect and conserve it. Burke has a rare genetic difference called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and is disabled due to systemic joint issues. In her spare time, she loves to hike, is a traditional cottage, gar cottage gardener, and owns a circa 1922 coach house in a historic district. Without further ado, I will hand it over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Stacey. Hello, everyone. Um, it's great to be with you today, and um, thank you for joining us. Um, my screen sharing should start in just a moment, if it's working. It is working. Fabulous. So we are here today to talk about how to start a backyard revolution. 
uh, because if you've been paying attention to the news today about Florida's environment or this week or month or year, you've probably heard a, a lot of bad news, but we're not here today to talk about bad news. We're here today to talk about the good news. And the good news is that um, there are many ways that we can all as individuals work together to help Florida's native plants to survive and thrive and to help shift the needle a little bit so that there's less bad news about Florida's environment and more good news. And we're going to talk about 20 or so ways that we can all get involved in doing that today. So firstly, let's talk about a definition. What is a backyard revolution? Um, my husband majored in history at the University of Florida a few years ago. So when I say the word backyard revolution around him, he makes jokes about bringing out the guillotines. But I assure you, it's not that kind of revolution that we're talking about. There's no political upheaval involved. We're talking about a revolutionary change in landscape management habits that creates spaces for humans and nature to thrive together. And we're here to talk about the ways that we can all work together to preserve Florida's biodiversity by creating a natural yards movement that might hopefully be, in, be somewhat similar in scope to the natural yards movement, uh, the natural foods movement of the last 50 or so years. Um, and we're not just here to talk about backyards today. We've had some questions about, uh, um, is it just backyards? Um, and some comments that if the only thing that changes is people's backyards, that won't be enough to achieve our stated aims. And I agree with that. But backyards are the low hanging fruit. Um, if you have a backyard, you are probably free to make some changes to that yard without um, the HOA or code enforcement turning up immediately to tell you to stop. But we're not just talking about backyards today. We're also going to be talking about front yards, roadsides, parks, and some other spaces as well. So to give you a picture of what it is uh, that a backyard revolution would be, this is a photo of a pretty typical conventionally managed landscape in Florida today, where you have large expanses of lawn and just a few trees or shrubs around the outside. And this is another example. And these are landscapes that are high maintenance and use a lot of resources in terms of fertilizer and irrigation and that sort of thing, but provide relatively little in terms of ecosystem resources for other species. So we're talking about changing from this to something that might look more like this, where there is a wider variety and a, and a higher density of plantings in our gardens. Or it might look something like this, where we have native plants taking front and center in our yards and providing um, ecosystem services like pollen and seeds for food for other species um, as a feature of our gardens. But we also could be talking about something that looks like this, where there is a really strong sense of place to natural yards. And if what you have to work with is a very dry, sandy um, soil, if that's what your site is like, your plant palette might look something more like this. And we're also talking about intentionally creating space for other species to make their homes in our gardens as well. And that can become a feature of the garden in itself. For example, uh, this lovely bumblebee here is helpfully pollinating somebody's blueberries for them so that they get a better crop yield that year. And this helpful native bee is pollinating um, some wildflowers so that they come back in profu profusion again next year. And it's not just about the services that these other species can provide in the garden. It's also about the sheer beauty of them in their own rights. For example, um, this gorgeous um, green metallic sweat bee, um, they almost look like little flying jewels in the garden. We also have so many wonderful species of butterflies that you can invite into your gardens in Florida. For example, monarchs or zebra longwings, or there are actually many species of swallowtails that are native here, such as these ones or these. We also have um, sulfur butterflies and these ones, which I'm told are called little blues. There are also many species of hummingbirds that, uh, that will come to your garden if you make a, a nice home for them, as well as other birds. 
including woodpeckers. And other animals that you can welcome into your garden include frogs. If you're very lucky, a gopher tortoise might set up its home um, in your yard. You will almost certainly get some of these adorable little green anoles, which are widely distributed um, in a lot of Florida. And it's also about making some unusual friends in the garden. Um, for example, I'm not normally a fan of snakes, but this little guy, the North American black racist snake, Kaluba constrictor, is very welcome in my garden. And there's actually a, a family of them that live in my garden now. Um, and they are wonderful. Uh, they are harmless to humans. They are non-venomous, uh, but they love to eat small rodents. Um, so they patrol my vegetable garden all the time. And I haven't, I haven't spotted any kind of small rodent in my yard for a long time. And another unlikely friend uh, for the natural gardener is the caterpillar, because if you want all of those gorgeous butterflies, that we saw a minute ago, making a little bit of room for the caterpillars is essential. And some of them are actually very beautiful in their own right, like these little guys. So what we're talking about is a natural yards movement, which might end up being something like the natural foods movement um, of the last 50 or so years. Um, and in the last 50 or so years, natural organic whole foods have gone from being a very fringe interest to something that's available in mainstream grocery stores. It wasn't actually until the 1940s that the term organic was even invented. And prior to that, um, practically all our agriculture is what we would today call organic. Um, and it wasn't until the 1970s that natural foods first began to really popularize um, with health food stores um, starting to open around the place and some popular books about um, natural eating. Um, and today you can walk into pretty much any Walmart or Publix and find right there on the shelves, um, organic, vegan, gluten-free, natural, clean eating options all readily available. And the drivers for that behavioral change have been first and foremost, the benefits to humans own health, but also um, environmental concerns and concerns for the welfare of other species have also been key motivators. And there are actually similar benefits um, to natural yards as there are um, to natural foods. So to summarize the difference between the conventional landscaping of today and natural yards, um, very briefly, in a conventional landscape, there are typically very limited plant species and mostly they are exotics. In natural yards, often we're looking at having more plant species, having diverse communities of plants, um, and concentrating on having mostly native plants and no invasives. Um, conventional landscapes are very high maintenance. You need a great deal of chemicals in the form of pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers. Um, there is a lot of maintenance that is done uh, with power tools and mowers, which causes a lot of noise and air pollution. Um, and there's also a lot of irrigation. Um, the, the maintenance for natural yards is fundamentally very different. We aim for no chemicals whatsoever and to find effective biological controls instead. And the maintenance, especially once a natural yard is established, um, it's less often compared to all of the mowing and power tools that go into a conventional landscape, but in some ways it is more skilled. Um, another very key difference between conventional landscapes and natural yards is in regard to insects. In conventional landscaping, all insects are eliminated typically using uh, poisons and bug zappers and that sort of thing. Whereas in natural yards, we welcome butterflies, bumblebees, dragonflies, and other beneficial insects. And we do that in part by intentionally making homes for them, such as leaving some bare ground for bees, because if the ground is covered with heavy pine bark mulch, especially um, native ground dwelling bees don't have anywhere to live. Um, the the approach to organic material is also different, where in conventional landscapes, typically it's carted off site immediately. Whereas in natural yards, a snag can become a really important feature of the garden, providing nesting space for birds um, and potentially perches as well. Uh, logs and brush piles can actually become a feature as well. There's often a compost heap in a corner somewhere. 
And the pine straw mulch that falls from native pine trees especially is considered an important um, garden resource um, to use for mulch. Um, there's also a lot of what's called botanical sexism in conventional landscaping, where male plants, especially male trees, are considered superior because they don't drop fruit, so you don't have to clean up after them. But instead, they produce a great deal of pollen and can actually worsen people's allergies. Whereas in natural yards, fruiting plants are considered an important ecosystem resource for the wildlife. And conventional landscapes tend to be very static. Um, often they look, in where I live in South Florida, often exactly the same in the middle of winter as they do in the middle of summer. Uh, whereas natural yards, um, you're looking to create a dynamic, interesting space that changes with the seasons. And you know, we're going to talk a little bit about the reasons to start a backyard revolution. And my top three reasons are, firstly, the health benefits for us as human beings. Secondly, this is a way that we can help to prevent or re reverse biodiversity loss. And thirdly, I'm going to talk briefly about some other environmental benefits as well. So there are many benefits to human health um, for living closely with plants. And I'm not going to read out all of this, um, but some of the benefits um, that are well proven in the scientific literature about these benefits include better sleep, enhanced immunity, improved circadian, circadian functioning, which is your body clock, um, less cardiovascular and respiratory disease, decreased allergies, improved digestion, and it's well known that having a garden tends to lead to increased physical activity. Then there are also a lot of mental and emotional benefits um, of having plants, including reduced anxiety and stress, decreased depression, enhanced memory, um, increased creativity, enhanced productivity and attention, and improved self-esteem. And there is even scientific literature showing that people who buy many plants have greater happiness and life satisfaction. And the source for all of this, if you're interested in the health benefits of plants, these two papers are really great resources. They are literature reviews um, that summarize all the different research that has been done into the health benefits of plants um, in terms of different uh, medical conditions and psychological conditions. Um, and you can download these for free online. Okay, the second key benefit to natural yards is that you can get involved in helping to preserve key species like butterflies and bumblebees by treating your backyard as an intentionally created habitat. And I said there wouldn't be ba bad news in this presentation, so I'm going to go through this very quickly just for background. Um, there is a lot of biodiversity loss going on in Florida right now. Um, the accepted number right now is that approximately a thousand people move here each day. And there is a lot of development going on to make room for the homes for all the new people here. And we have about 70 endangered wildlife species here in Florida, many more that are threatened. In fact, about 44% of vertebrates here are known or suspected to be declining. And for plants, the numbers are even higher. There are 448 that are endangered, 118 threatened, and nine that are being commercially exploited. And there's also a big issue with non-native species displacing natives in their home range. And if you're not already familiar with this, um, a great background primer that was published by the University of Florida a few years ago uh, is called Threats to Florida's Biodiversity. And I would recommend um, reading that. And this isn't an issue that is in any way unique to us here in Florida. You might have heard the term insect apocalypse being bandied around and there is a species in extinction crisis um, that is going on all across um, the United States and the world right now. And then there are also some other environmental benefits um, to switching to more natural yard management practices uh, because a healthy environment really does start at home. And some of the benefits, um, a lot of the water quality issues that we have here in Florida, for example, red tide, um, blue-green algae and other harmful algae blooms are worsened due to irrigation and fertilizers. Um, we also know that a lack of trees tends to exacerbate heat island effects 
and trees are also really important to maintain air quality um, because of their, their ability to filter the air for us. Natural shorelines are also well known to decrease hurricane impacts and having less chemicals and less noise pollution um, in the immediate vicinity of where you live in your own backyard um, is also known to be something that can be very helpful to human health. So now I'm gonna get into talking about how do we start a backyard revolution? And I'm going to talk about a whole lot of different ways that if you would like to be involved in helping to preserve Florida's biodiversity, um, how you can get involved. And they fall into four main categories, setting an example, educating yourself and others, um, policy and practices reform, and supporting and volunteering with some key organizations, including the Florida Wildflower Foundation. And as I'm talking today, um, I have a challenge for you in the audience. Um, and what I would like you to do is, as I'm presenting, ask yourself, could you do this? Is this something that you could do? And if your answer is yes, um, please put a thumbs up in the chat to let me know. I mean, I can't actually see the chat, so I, I won't see it immediately, but please put a thumbs up in the chat and everyone else here at the Wildfire Foundation can see it. And I just wanna be clear, you're not committing to anything at this point. We just wanna get an idea of how feasible each of these concepts are um, for people to do around Florida. So firstly, we're going to talk about some ways that you can set an example. And this little fellow here is doing an amazing job of setting an example. He's just planted a whole lot of lovely native plants and now he's watering them in until they get established. And some of the ways that you can set, set an example are by showing ecological best practices in action um, in whatever spaces you might manage, such as your own backyard. And that includes planting natives, growing food, aiming to use no chemicals in your garden, minimizing the use of power tools, leaving some bare ground for bees um, and growing extra plants or saving seeds to share with others. And to inspire you to plant more Florida natives, here is one of my favorite um, Florida animals, the hunting, hummingbird and my favorite Florida plant uh, Monada punctata, and I included this not just because it's pretty, but also because I think it really highlights the relationships between native plants um, and the animals that depend on them. So if, I'd, if I've inspired you to plant some more Florida natives and you'd like to know where to get started, uh, two great starting points are the Florida Association of Native Nurseries. And if you go to the website on your screen right there, plantrealflorida.org, um, that will direct you to um, the native nurseries in your area where you can purchase live native plants. And another great source is the Florida Wildflower Seed Growers Co-op, which is floridawildflowers.com. And that is a fabulous source um, for buying seed for your wildflower gardens. But if you're wondering, uh, what should I plant? Um, some resources that can help you with this. The Florida Wildflower Foundation, our website, flawildflowers.org, has a lot of information about native plants. It's all available for free. And I draw your attention, especially to our plant profiles, uh, which are great for learning more about native plants that you might be able to plant in your own yard. Another fabulous resource is a book that we published a couple of years ago, which was written by Stacy, who was here with us a moment ago, and another board member, Nancy Bissett. It's called Native Plants for Florida Gardens. It has a hundred different uh, native plants in it and it's available on our website. And another resource is the Florida Native Plant Society, which operates um, chapters all around the state. And that's a place where you can go to get advice about which native plants will grow in your area. And their website is fnps.org. Um, but I also just wanted to highlight that you don't necessarily have to spend money to increase the native plants in your yard. Another way that you can do that is by making sure that you're identifying all of the volunteers that come up from seed in your own garden. Um, and the iNaturalist app is a great tool for do, to do that, which I'll speak about in a little bit. And to get you inspired, this is a photo that was taken at Green Isle Gardens, which is a wonderful um, native plant nursery that's between Orlando and Tampa. 
um, that the Florida Wildflower Foundation sometimes partners with for events and pro projects. And they have a wonderful selection of native plants um, and a wildflower meadow as well. Okay, another way that you can set an example is by growing food. And there are actually many natives that are edible. And we, we at the Florida Wildflower Foundation have actually produced two webinars previously about edible natives. Um, there's one called Incredible Edible Natives, which talks a lot about landscaping plants um, that you can also eat. And there's another called I Eat Flowers and Other Things, which has some really inspiring recipes and photos uh, that were all made using Florida native plants. There's also a book called Florida's, Florida's Edible Wild Plants um, that you can buy. Um, but even if most of what you're growing to eat uh, isn't native, growing natives around them is still very, very important because there are many um, species of food crops where some or all varieties of that crop need insects or other animals in order to pollinate them. And they include avocados, bananas, berries, including blueberries, um, raspberries and blackberries, um, grapes, mangoes, papaya, melons, pumpkins and tomatoes. And native plants really help to support the pollinator populations that you need to pollinate those crops. And they do that in two ways. Firstly, um, if you've got a wide variety of natives planted, you will probably have food and shelter for those pollinators all year round so that uh, they are there when you need them for your crops. But also, just like us, pollinators need to eat a varied diet and the native plants can provide nutrients for them that are sometimes absent um, if they're only um, getting their food from pollinating crops. And even more importantly, we're here talking about a backyard revolution. And as far as persuading humans to rethink some of their habits, food in some ways are the, are the ultimate charismatic species. Um, pretty much all humans agree that eating food is a good thing. So I've found that it's a great way to start conversations um, with my neighbors about uh, why having native plants in my yard is important. And another way to set an example is by adopting some natural yard management best practices. And one of those is to leave some bare ground for bees because this gorgeous green sweat bee um, that you can see on your screen, um, our native bees, uh, they don't nest in hives the way that European honeybees do. They are typically um, yeah, solitary and ground dwelling and they need to be able to get to the ground um, to, to nest and to have somewhere to live. So being careful about your mulching habits and leaving some bare ground where the bees can have a home is really important. Also really important is aiming for zero chemicals, no pesticides, no herbicides, no fertilizers. Uh, pesticides especially, it's so easy in the garden to try to poison um, one particular pest insect species and wind up poisoning a lot of beneficial insects as well, or instead of the species you were trying to poison. Um, so we eliminate chemicals, uh, minimize power tool use because there are many natives that don't like having, for example, having their roots chopped up by a weed whacker. Um, we, and it's also important to allow your wildflowers to go to seed so they can come back the next year and ideally to also save some seeds and share them with others. And if you're listening to everything that I've said so far and saying, well, I already do all of that, then I have a pro move for you. And that's to help us develop a new naturalism for Florida. Because one of the challenges in starting a backyard revolution is what I call the aesthetic palatability challenge, where many people say they just don't like the look of native gardens. Um, the tropical look is the typical aesthetic here in Florida at the moment and figuring out how we move beyond the tropical look um, to a more sustainable um, style of landscaping is a little bit challenging because in a way we need to create a recognisable, marketable aesthetic style that specifically creates room for humans and nature to thrive together. And it also needs to be photogenic. 
one of the things that really drove the up the, the uptake of the tropical look um, was Florida tourism uh, because people want their vacation photos to look exotic and the tropical look features a lot of plants that do look very exotic in a holiday photo. So my challenge for any professionals who are with us today, say designers, landscape architects, horticulturalists and landscapers is to get involved in helping us to create a new naturalism for Florida. But we don't only need professionals. We also need dedicated home gardeners, the kind of people who might already be doing all the things that I've just talked about to also be helping to work out what works in your individual um, in your individual sort of environment and what is realistic for a home gardener to do in terms of upkeep of this style of garden and for some inspiration for a new naturalism I want to show you two projects which have been very successful um, that were about creating room for humans and nature to thrive together and one pictured here is the High Line in New York City which some of you may have visited and another is the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park in London. And these are both projects where the brief included, um, including a lot of local biodiversity and having a, a seasonal garden that is wildlife friendly, as well as having spaces that are very obviously set out for human use as well. And if you're interested in getting involved with this, there is a great annual event um, called the Outside Collab um, which is about creating a new Florida landscape paradigm um, to encourage the uptake of more sustainable landscape management practices. And I believe this year's event is in the next couple of days. So next we're gonna talk about some ways that you can help uh, to educate yourself and also other people about the importance of native plants and natural yards. And this is about showing leadership for better landscaping practices. Um, and amongst your family and friends, but also your neighbours and your wider community. It's about building appreciation of natural plant, of native plants and the benefits of natural yards. But it's also equally about creating communities of practice in your local area. So you can learn from one another about what works and also share resources like seeds and cuttings and seedlings. And I'm gonna show you some simple ways to get started with this. Um, first of all, I'm going to talk very quickly about some fabulous books um, to read yourself if you haven't already, but these are also wonderful gifts. Um, the holidays is coming up, so you might be looking for Christmas gift ideas. Um, they're also great birthday gifts or other occasions, um, but it doesn't have to just be for your friends and family either. Um, there are many um, organisations like local libraries and garden clubs that are very happy to receive uh, gifts of books. So if there's one in your local area that you think might benefit from having some of these, um, I would recommend reaching out to them. And one book that we highly recommend is Native Plants for Florida Gardens, which Stacey wrote, which I mentioned before. Another is Bringing Nature Home by Doug Tallamy, um, which is not specifically about Florida, but it's an excellent primer on why it's so important to, um, to invite nature into our yards. Uh, I also mentioned Florida's Edible Wild Plants, um, which is a great book, which I highly recommend to anyone who's interested in learning more about eating uh, native plants. Um, there's also a butterfly gardening with Florida's native plants. Um, it's more of a booklet than a book, but it was published by the Florida Native Plant Society a few years ago, and for butterfly gardeners especially. Um, this is a great book because um, butterfly gardening is a wonderful thing to take up, but some of the online communities, um, some of the information that's been spreading isn't entirely helpful in Florida. So learning a little bit more about um, Florida's butterflies is really important. And then another one that I highly recommend is the Allergy Fighting Garden. And while most of the, book, most of the plants mentioned in this book are not native to Florida, for anyone who thinks that they can't garden because of their allergies, um, I also have allergies and this is a fabulous book for learning how to design your garden to minimize um, allergy problems. Um, we also have a lot of great uh, wildflower resources that we publish here at the Florida Wildflower Foundation. They include the ones that you see on your screen. There's the 20 easy to grow wildflowers magazine, which 
um, is distributed very widely, including a, at a lot of um, fan member nurseries. We published three different brochures, Attracting Birds, Attracting Butterflies, and another which isn't on your screen, which is called Attracting Bees and Other Beneficial Insects. And we also have about 20 or so fact sheets, um, including the ones you can see, Wildflowers for Shade, Creating a Pollinator Pot, and Monarchs and Milkweed. All of these, you can download them for free um, on our website, but we will also send out professionally printed copies of all of these um, for distribution in places like libraries, extension offices, garden clubs, and community centres. And if you haven't already seen these, um, you can go to your local fan member nursery, that's the Florida Association of Native Nurseries, and many of them circulate them. Um, but if there's a place in your local area that seems like a good place to circulate these where they don't currently have them, we will send them um, brochures for free if they request them. Um, we have a form on the website for requesting that. And I say free with an asterisk because um, if you are a member of the Florida Wildflower Foundation, we will send them out entirely free of charge. If you're not currently a member, we do request that you make a donation to pay for the postage to help defray our costs. And something that you can do um, if you'd like to distribute some of this literature from your own frank front yard is installing an info box and the photo that you can see is the info box that I have in my own front yard and this works best in neighbors in neighborhoods that have a lot of foot traffic for example I live in a historic district and we very regularly we have a lot of um, visitors we have a self-guided walking tour uh, which gets around 5,000 visitors per year through the neighborhood we're also a popular spot for walking dogs and walking for fitness and cycling um, and skateboarding and, and that sort of thing for our neighbours in, in, in nearby neighbourhoods and in some condo towers nearby. Um, so if you have a, yard, a front yard that has a lot of foot traffic, it's really simple to do this. You can buy an info box on Amazon. Um, they're, they're quick to install. If you already have a post, um, even if you don't, hammering a post into the ground to hold one only takes a few minutes. Uh, you can order the Florida Wildflower Foundation literature online at the, um, at the order form we just talked about. And I put a label on my box that says, gardening information, please take one. And this has been a really great tool for starting conversations with my neighbours and with passersby about why my garden looks a little bit different um, and why I do things a little bit differently to other gardeners. And another thing that you could potentially do is starting a little free library or a little free seed library. If you're not already familiar with little free libraries, um, these are little cupboards that people set up and they're usually like a, a give a book, take a book cupboard. Um, but the ones that you can see on your screen, um, the blue one, this is a seed exchange that was set up um, inside a community garden space, I believe in Washington State. Um, so people could leave seeds and take seeds for their gardens. And the other one um, is a free swap library, um, which there's a little bit of writing on the front that's too small to read, but it says that you can swap books, seeds and other small items there. And that one's in New Zealand. Um, and that's something that if you have a lot of foot traffic, you can set one up on your own property. Um, but many libraries are also now setting up seed libraries. So you can ask your local library about starting a seed library or if they already have one, ask them about ordering some Florida native wildflower seeds and distributing, um, distributing those as well. Now, another thing that you can do to help your community to bring in some funding for native plants to use for educational purposes is to promote the grant programs that we run here at the Florida Wildflower Foundation, um, which include Viva Florida and Seedlings for Schools. And we also have a library grant program that's coming soon. So Viva Florida, this is our, our demonstration garden grant program, and we make grants of up to $3,000 for purchasing native plants for display plantings. We mostly make grants to community organizations such as nature centers or city government. And in the coming cycle, which opens in January, some key areas for us are Southeast Florida, Jacksonville, Tallahassee, and Naples. And if you're listening today and you're in one of those areas, 
Um, if you can think of a community organization in your area that would be a great spot um, for a native plant display garden, please let them know about Beaver Florida and encourage them to apply for a grant or at least reach out to us and have a conversation about possibly applying for a grant. And then our other biggest program is seedlings for schools. And what we do there is every year we send out native plant seedlings for free to a lot of teachers all around the state of Florida um, for use in their classroom activities. Um, and if you know a teacher in your local area who, um, who could use some native plants there, um, in their teaching, please let them know about the program. And as I mentioned, we are also going to be launching um, a, a grant program aimed specifically at local libraries in the near future. And if you would like to know about that, I would strongly suggest subscribing to our newsletter um, on our website so that you can hear about that um, as soon as it's launched. And then another thing that you can do is you can organize a talk because we here at the Florida Wildflower Foundation provide speakers for community organizations. And for example, um, there on your screen, you can see our current vice chair of the board, CJ McCartney talking to a group, I believe it was at a garden club. Um, and I'm just gonna read you the quote that's on the screen because I think it's very applicable. I used to think somebody should do something about that. Then one day I realized, I was somebody. So we have speakers available now in North Florida, Central Florida and South Florida. We mostly speak to organizations like garden clubs, extension offices and libraries. And we can offer speakers either in person or in Zoom. Our specialties are native plants and attracting wildlife, obviously. But we will also have um, this presentation, how to start a backyard revolution available as well. There's a request to speaker form um, on our website that can, you can use if you know of a community organization um, that would like likely be interested. And I'm also going to talk about how you can help us to educate the public about Florida's native wildflowers via social media. And one of the reasons to do this is that I find that generally discussing gardening and native plants, especially online, it is such a positive and uplifting topic and the communities usually are also really positive and uplifting. And I think we all know that sometimes that can be a little bit hard to find on social media. So we have a few official Florida Wildflower Foundation accounts. We have our Facebook account that you can see there on the screen. We also have a couple of Instagram accounts and we're also on YouTube, LinkedIn and Flickr. And I'll show you all of those in just a second. But it's equally important to be posting about wildflowers and your love of wildflowers on your own personal accounts and sharing your love of Florida's nature with the people you love. Um, and then another thing that you can do is joining or starting a group online. There are lots of great um, discussion groups for native plants, um, but Starting a group is also an option. For example, during COVID, I started a gardening group um, on the Nextdoor app and that's still going now. It's grown to almost 1500 members and it's a really helpful space for um, discussing very local gardening issues. So on the screen right now, you can see our two, um, our two Instagram accounts that we run here at the Florida Wildflower Foundation. Our official one, um, FLA Wildflowers, you can see some pictures from there on the left. And I think the quote there is very applicable. There are always flowers for those who want to see them, especially on our Instagram accounts. And yeah, the main account is mostly images um, that we created here at the Wildflower Foundation. But we also have a second Instagram account, FLA Wildflower Watch, um, which we use for sharing um, wildflower pictures that other people have taken. And if you would like to participate in this, uh, we have a hashtag FLA wildflowers that you can put on your images. So if you would like images this gorgeous on your Instagram, you can hit share on any of these and share them and tag your own images with FLA wildflowers and you might see them on FLA wildflower watch. We also have a YouTube channel. Um, we, we have been posting our monthly webinars uh, there for quite some time and there are many great 
uh, webinars to watch, including the two I just mentioned um, yeah, about yeah, edible natives and I eat flowers. And then we are also active on LinkedIn, which you can see on the left and on Flickr, which you can see on the right. So I encourage you to connect with us on any of, of those social media platforms. And then another great tool is the iNaturalist app. And this is available for iPhone or Android. And what you can do with it is you can pull your phone out of your pocket, snap a quick picture and get help IDing that plant instantly using AI. So the image on your left, you can see a pink sundew that I spotted while I was out on a walk. And I took a picture, immediately got some suggestions and was able to, to, to figure out what it was. But the most powerful thing about the iNaturalist app is that it's a community of scientists. So your plant observations will often be corrected by local botanists and people like that who really know what they're talking about. Um, for example, the second screenshot that you can see there you can see that Dr. Jay Horn, who's a botany professor at Florida Gulf Coast University, came along and confirmed that I had correctly ID'd the musky mint there. Um, and then all of the observations that you upload to iNaturalist are then available to scientists worldwide. And one of the things they use this for is for helping to track the migration of species due to climate change. Um, and it's also a great way for documenting the results of your own natural yards um, experiments. Um, my own garden is something of a, a local biodiversity hotspot on iNaturalist now with over 100 species having been observed there. And this is also the tool that I recommend to people for IDing any unknown plants that come up in your garden as volunteers before you pull them out, um, because you can get some really interesting natives in your garden that way. And then another way uh, that you can help educate people is by sharing the love. Now, let's say you have a, a talent, say you're great at photography or painting or writing or something like that. Please consider making um, Florida's wildflowers and your love of them one of the subjects of your work and sharing your love of them with people that way. For example, on the screen right now, you can see a, an absolutely exquisite watercolor um, done by a Florida artist named Kim Heiss, who has decided to specialize in painting um, Florida's native plants and wildlife. Um, and she does some absolutely stunning work, but you don't have to be quite this talented to get involved here. And I've shared some of my own modest efforts as well. I personally, I really like um, to grow cut flowers and make bouquets to give to people. Um, the cut flower trade is very environmentally harmful. Um, and some of my native, some of my favorite plants to include in my homemade bouquets now are natives. And you can see small pictures on the screen there of two of my favorites, the Coreopsis and the spotted bee balm, Monada punctata. I also cook with natives a lot. Um, for example, I make beauty berry syrup regularly, which is wonderful in sodas, beauty berry sodas and beauty berry cocktails. And giving people a gift of a bunch of flowers um, or a drink or something like that, it's a wonderful way to start conversations with people about native plants and why they're so important to me. Okay, next we're going to talk about some ways that you can get involved in reforming policy and practices. And we're going to talk about when and why you might like to talk with your HOA, your city or county government, um, and also developers in your area. So firstly, HOAs, we've probably all seen these stories that turn up in the media periodically about HOAs cracking down hard upon people who try to do anything that's even a little bit different in their yard. And the law in Florida, uh, many HOAs have bylaws that restrict your landscaping choices, but it's actually the law in Florida that all HOAs must allow Florida friendly landscaping. And even though this has been the law since 2009, there are still some HOAs out there that haven't got the message. And if you are living in one of those HOAs, if you are being told that there are no natives allowed um, in your community, that's probably illegal because 
not allowing any Florida native plants really is not very Florida friendly. So getting your HOA to upload, update their bylaws and enforcement practices in line with the law can be a way um, to be allowed to plant more native plants if you're being told that it's not allowed. And there's a link there on the screen um, for some resources that you, the University of Florida prepared to help um, people living in HOAs. Then another time that you might need to get involved. If you are driving down the road one day and you see some really gorgeous native wildflowers by the side of the road, like these, or these, we really need you to reach out to your local government, uh, such as your city or county government about it, because many of these really wonderful um, naturally occurring um, native wildflowers along the roadsides are literally always one phone call away from being mown into destruction. There are people who make a point of phoning up the city or county anytime they see long grass. And, and if it's flowering and going to seed, that can be even more likely to get them to call up and complain. And in many areas, um, it only takes one person calling roads maintenance to say, hey, you really need to mow the area at such and such. And they will just go and mow it, no questions asked, unfortunately. So if you see wonderful native wildflowers, I strongly, uh, um, I strongly recommend that you call up the roads maintenance department at your city or county and tell them, hey, it's so great that these native wildflowers are here. Please don't mow them until after they've set seed. It would be great if they're able to come back again next year. Um, and you can also connect the people in roads maintenance with the Florida Wildflower Foundation. Um, often we can give them advice about the best practices for managing the wildflowers um, that you have in your area ourselves. And if we can't, we can connect them um, with experts who, who can. And then the other time that you might want to have a talk with your local city or county um, is to do with local plants. If you would like to see more natives, you can reach out to your parks and rec department and let them know that. And if there's an area, um, if there's a place in your area that might be a great place for a demonstration garden, you can send them information about our Viva Florida grant program and potentially bring some money in to help with, with some native plantings. And lastly, if you're somebody who's living in a new development, especially a new development that's being marketed as being eco-friendly, one thing that we are working on here at the Florida Friendly, the Florida Wildflower Foundation, um, it's in early stages at the moment, but we're looking into a bounce back model of how to reestablish native plants as quickly as possible after development or redevelopment of a site. And I'm looking for some pioneer communities uh, who would be interested in having a talk with me initially um, and potentially um, be becoming um, a pioneer community that helps to learn how to establish um, native plants again as quickly as possible. So please contact me if your community might be interested. I'll have my personal contact details on the screen in just a couple of minutes. Um, and you, you're welcome to reach out to me if, if your community might be interested. And lastly, I'm gonna talk very quickly about some ways that you can support and volunteer with um, the Florida Wildflower Foundation and some other organizations um, that are our partners in a backyard revolution. So here at the Florida Wildflower Foundation, um, you can support us and help us to grow um, by volunteering. Um, we have, uh, we probably periodically need volunteers for special events. Um, for example, later this month in Gainesville, we have a bee city planting that we're participating in. Um, if you would like to learn about volunteer opportunities, please subscribe to our newsletter. Um, you can also go to our website if you would like to make a donation or become a member. But our very biggest fundraiser is the Florida State Wildflower License Plate. And this license plate, um, we have, I think it's about 29,500 on the road right now. Um, and each of those people who has the plate 
makes a $15 donation each year when they renew um, their license. So um, for only $15 a year, you could have the very best fashion accessory any motor vehicle can possibly have. Um, and if you already have the Wildflower Plate, um, you actually get a free membership to the Florida Wildflower Foundation with your plate, but the Florida Department of Transport doesn't give us your details. So we need you to reach out to us and let us know. And there's a form where you can contact us and let us know that you have the plate. Some other great organisations that I strongly encourage you to support are the Florida Native Plant Society and the Florida Federation of Garden Clubs. Um, they both, they operate local chapters and these are both places where you can go um, to get advice about native plants and advice about gardening um, in your area. And we also uh, strongly encourage you to support um, your local native nurseries, which you can find via plantrealflorida.org, um, which is the, the Florida Association of Native Nurseries, and the Florida Wildflower Seed Growers Co-op, which is floridawildflowers.com. Um, while I've been vol volunteering with the foundation, I've had the pleasure of getting to know um, some people who run native nurseries and wildflower seed farms. And um, these are locally owned small businesses and the people who run them are very committed and hardworking. And I strongly encourage you to support them um, when you're purchasing plants or seed. And now I have a challenge for everyone in the audience. And my challenge to you is that to start a backyard revolution, we really need a lot of people to take small actions. So I'd like to ask you now um, to think about the 20 plus concepts we've, that we've just talked about and choose just one that you can do yourself and to put it in chat. I'm gonna put them all on the screen again in just a second um, to refresh your memory, but because I wouldn't ask you to do anything that I wouldn't do myself, um, I've actually chosen three myself. I'm going to buy more native plants which is an out of character, but I'm also going to finish reading Bringing Nature Home. I've been reading it for about two years and I keep getting busy with other things and putting it to one side. So I'm making a commitment in front of all of you to make the time to finish reading it. And I'm also going to find one site in my local area to distribute Wildflower Foundation resources. And on your screen at the moment, I'm not gonna read all of these out, um, but this is a summary of the different ideas that we've talked about today. And I'm gonna give you just a couple of seconds more to read them all and have a think about what you can do yourself and put one in chat. And this presentation wouldn't have been possible today um, without the talents of some wonderful photographers and a wonderful artist. So many thanks to Emily Bell, who is our in-house photographer and communication coordinator who contributed many of the stunningly beautiful photos that you saw today. Um, to CJ McCartney, our vice chair, who contributed the photos of some of the native landscapes. Um, to Kim Heiss, whose stunning watercolor I, I used in the presentation and it's there again. And then the photographs that were taken outside of Florida, um, they were the work of some very talented photographers who um, make their work available to complete strangers, um, free of charge through um, open source licenses so that community groups like us can use them. So I wanted to say a quick thank you to Brian Ledgard, Peter O'Connor, Stephen Pavlov and Tom Ackroyd. So I'm gonna stop screen sharing in just a second and I can stay for a little bit longer if anyone has questions that they'd like to ask. Thank you, Sarah. That was wonderful. And just seeing all the comments in the chat, um, yeah, you're inspiring a lot of people to, to do some good. And um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, early on in uh, one of your slides, you um, were talking about the differences between conventional landscaping and natural yards. And someone asked, um, with regard to maintenance, you have less often and more skill. Does it take more skill to manage a native landscape? I think the answer to that is it depends. And having communities of practice in your local area is really important to this. Um, as my garden has gotten more mature, there's still a little bit of hand weeding involved, um, torpedo grass in particular. I don't think I'm ever going to be completely rid of it. And there's a lot of pruning as well. Um, but yeah, it, it, 
there's a learning process for learning to manage your own natural yard because no two natural yards are exactly identical. There's a sense of place. Um, so there is a little bit of learning involved, but um, yeah, I think it's very hard to do a, an apples to apples comparison about the maintenance involved um, for conventional yards versus um, natural yards because it depends. Yeah, it's um, it, yes, it very much depends on <laughs> what uh, yeah, what you're trying to accomplish, right? Yeah, there are lower maintenance and higher maintenance options um, within uh, within either approach. And um, we have another question. Um, uh, what are the best months for no mow in Florida? I see there's a national national no mow in May movement, but we're different here. That is a fabulous question. And I'm a communication strategist <laughs> rather than a botanist. So um, if someone else, uh, I know we have people who know more about the botany side of things than myself. If someone would like to jump in and answer that, that would be wonderful. Well, I think I can, I can speak generally um, because this was a um, an effort that was started in the UK with the goal of encouraging people to leave those early flower, floral resources to provide food and um, and shelter for newly emerging native bees. So it's really about the start of the growing season. So here it's more like late winter to early spring, but it depends on where in Florida you are too, uh, because you know the Panhandle climate there is much different than what's happening in South Florida. Um, but it's really about looking at the growing season and just providing resources when they might otherwise be limited. Um, I will add to that, though, that especially here in Florida, it's not just about not mowing your grass. If all you have is a St. Augustine lawn and you just let that grow for a month, it's not really going to do the trick that you're trying to accomplish with this no mow um, effort. It's really just as important, more so possibly, um, to add native wildflowers to your landscape and to include species that are blooming at different times of the year, uh, including that late winter and early spring when there's, um, when there's not a lot of other things available. That's, <laughs> that's my, um, yeah, this, it, we get, we hear a lot about it, um, but yeah, May is pretty general for uh, where it came from and not necessarily the best advice for Florida. In the chat, someone shared a link for no more lawns from um, the Orange County Extension Office. And apparently in North Florida, it's um, no more March. That makes a lot more sense. That's when, um, yeah, our spring is going to be a lot earlier than May. Um, there aren't any more questions in the q and I know there have been a few in the chat. Um, there's there was one question about best practices on how to convince local municipalities to go native. Do you have any suggestions for talking points? Um, in terms of the landscaping that they're planting themselves, or in terms of code enforcement, did they did they specify? They did not specify. Okay, because I have more and more experience on the code enforcement side of things because of. Um, the city of Fort Myers having some issues with my <laughs> garden um, and in that instance reaching out to um, the extension office and also the food forest at um, Florida Gulf Coast University they were both amazingly helpful um, in explaining to the city uh, why it's important to allow homeowners um, to adopt more um, more sustainable landscaping practices um, on the municipal side of things, as far as, um, you know, the, the maintenance departments and that sort of thing, they tend to be quite set in their ways. And um, often they're very, the biggest concern is being able um, to meet their budgets, like the cost of, of switching over to natives um, can be a big factor for them in my experience. Um, and often there's an inertia about um, they're not really sure, you know, everyone knows how to maintain the very specific things that they typically plant. So there's also a learning curve. So um, getting municipalities to, to change over all of their, all of what they're planting themselves, that can be a little bit of an uphill, uphill battle I've found. 
Yeah, that's um that <laughs> that could be a whole webinar unto itself. It really could actually. Well, I think we are a little bit over time. So I'm um, just being mindful of everybody's schedule. I'm going to uh, say we're going to wrap this up. But thank you so much, Sarah. This has been a really wonderful and inspirational presentation. And uh, uh, again, just based on the comments in the chat, I think uh, a lot of people are excited to, to join the revolution. Yep, and thank you everyone so much for being here today and, and spending this time with us. All right, and we'll be sending out the link to the recording in uh, 24 to 48 hours, and uh, along with resources that were covered in this webinar. And uh, please join us next month for um, pruning native plants. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Sarah. Bye, everyone. <laughs>